So turn with me, if you will, to the gospel according to Matthew, uh, chapter 13, and I'm going to hop around a little bit. I'm going to read verses 31 through 33, uh, then I'm going to read verses 44 through 52. Again, that is the gospel according to Matthew 31 through 33 and 44 through 52. Uh, I'd ask you know, all those who are physically able to stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, there are many translations of God's word. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Amen. Let's see what it has to say for us today. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Another parable, he, he being Jesus, put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air Come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Going down to verse 44, it reads, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, when, which, which when it was full they drew to shore they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure new things and old. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, for the time that we get to spend together today for these few moments, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's heaven like? What? heaven like so i i grew up in a church culture that talked a lot about heaven a whole lot uh matter of fact uh the church that i grew up in uh the pastor had made a name for himself and uh, it was a pretty big church in indianapolis indiana and he had a um TV show. It was on BET for a while and in a couple other places. And he titled the broadcast Heaven on Earth Ministries uh, because the thought process was, and it's my theology as well, um, that you can have heaven on earth. Um, you know, I, I don't discount it. Uh, I'm not talking, I, I don't discount what happens to our soul in eternity, uh, but I am a firm believer in you got to take care of the stuff now and not just throw it off to the side waiting for the sweet by and by. Um, and there's some scripture behind that, but uh, we talked a lot about heaven no matter what church I was at, right? And heaven is... Uh, one of the major selling points of uh, being a Christian. When we are talking to people, evangelizing, uh, we often want to talk about heaven. 
uh, to convince people to become a Christian. Uh, we either uh, hype up heaven or we try to sell um, fire insurance uh, to people trying to get them to avoid going to hell. Um, so what is heaven like, right? Uh, uh, there are descriptions with people in white choir robes going around on clouds and uh, plucking on harps. Uh, you know, there's Revelation uh, 14, 2 through 3 that has uh, a, a description of heaven. You know, you have that iconic image uh, in newspaper cartoons um, that are based on heaven when they talk about the angel wings and the robes and the choir. Uh, and, and sometimes it's all thrown together randomly. Uh, we, we talk about a celestial city, right, where streets are paved with gold. Uh, that comes from Revelation 2. Uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, seems to believe uh, that heaven is like a, a tremendous banquet table. He says in uh, Isaiah 25 and 6, where there's this feast that's going on. And we also see Jesus in the gospel, according to Matthew, talking about heaven, talking about the kingdom of God, talking about the kingdom of heaven uh, through parables. Uh, kingdom of God, heaven, kingdom of heaven, all interchangeable uh, when we talk about the things of the Bible. Um, I'm partial to this, uh, being someone who sits on the district committee of ordained ministry, uh, one of the boards that Hayes, I mean, um, uh, examine people who want to become pastors and then also re-examine those who want to uh, retain their credentials until they become an ordained elder in full connection and you cannot mess with them anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but they, they, they have these things, and one of those things you have to be able uh, to answer articulately is about the kingdom of God. Uh, you got to be able to answer questions about the kingdom of God. And they look for buzzwords, right? And they, the, one of the buzzwords they want to hear, even though they won't say they want buzzwords, uh, they want to hear already and not yet. The kingdom of God is already and not yet. It's already... Because Jesus came, born of a virgin, came through 42 generations, lived a life we couldn't live, uh, gave himself up willingly for us, uh, rose again on the third day with all power in his hands, so it's already here. But it's not yet because we're waiting on him to come again. So already and not yet. So if anybody finds themselves in front of a DCOM anytime soon, I just gave you some free answers to the questions. Uh, but Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, and he puts it in the gospel according to Matthew, and I always wondered why the gospel according to Matthew is the first book of the, old, of the New Testament when it's not the oldest. Uh, when you look at when the Bible was written, well, not the Bible, the books of the Bible, Mark is older than Matthew. And the letters that Paul wrote to all those churches are older than the Gospels. But Matthew is the first book of the New Testament because it's the church-friendly Gospel. Uh, Jesus, it doesn't talk a, a lot about how Jesus got upset with the disciples because they didn't get what he was saying off the top. Um, there, there are no passages where he says, how long am I going to be with this generation? And how, how they, they, he, he has a little more grace in the story, in the gospel, according to Matthew, than he is in the gospel, according to Mark. And something I learned about this passage as well, in cemetery, seminary, 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 is that this passage is part of what they call the third discourse in the gospel according to Matthew. And Jesus 
Uh, they call it the parabolic discourse because he lists throughout this chapter all the different things. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. And Jesus gives a lot of plain, a lot of parables when he's teaching because he wants to be able to use plain language for people to be easier to understand. And he spends time talking about the kingdom of heaven over and over again because the kingdom is essential to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, one of the first things Jesus says when he comes out of the wilderness uh, fasting is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Already and not yet. Because when he says it's at hand, that's a play on words in the Greek. It literally means uh, it's within arm's reach. Not just coming, it's within arm's reach already and not yet. The work of Jesus is done and he's coming back again as well. And so the order of the kingdom has been set, but Christ coming in his final victory is on the way already and not yet. Kind of like uh, watching a blowout of a, of a football game, right? You, you, you know who's going to win. Labor Day Classic. You know who's going to win. The, 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 the clock just ain't read zero, zero yet. And so the order has been set in the gospel according to Matthew, uh, but there are still some things to do. And Jesus is trying to explain to them repeatedly. And so he uses these examples talking about mustard seeds and yeast and merchants and fish and on and on. And the interesting thing about each one of these parables, uh, I wonder sometimes, being a lectionary preacher, why they like to skip over certain verses. And I, I made a decision probably about 12 years ago I was going to be a lectionary preacher uh, just for biblical literacy so I could cover more parts of the Bible. Um, but I always wonder why they hop around like this. Uh, but the interesting thing about each one of these parables is that it's some bad mixed in with some good. And not only is it some bad mixed in with some good in these parables talking about heaven, talking about the kingdom of God, talking about the kingdom of heaven, uh, there are small things that become big. Uh, a mustard seed is so small it can be forgotten. Uh, I remember being in a Bible study one time long before I became a pastor and they passed out mustard seeds and they were on these pink pieces of paper that had to be a, a, a half inch by a half inch size and, and the mustard seed was so small you could have probably fit 10 seeds on there and still had space in between each seed and a mustard seed is so small that it can be forgotten and sometimes it would get mixed in with other seeds when they were, uh, the farmers were tossing stuff out, and so it ended up growing there. Something small became something big. Uh, and then the leaven, using that, that's something small that becomes something big, but it's also something bad mixed in with something good. Um, they weren't making food in factories or chemical processing plants back then. Uh, they had to use what was in front of them. And so leaven at the time was great bread today. And you left a little off to the side that might start to spoil. And you take a little piece of the bad bread from yesterday and mix it in with the dough for the bread today. And that little piece was enough to make the bread rise. That's why they would say a little leaven could lift a whole loaf. But you had to be careful, right? Because you, you, you're dealing with old bread and you're mixing it with new. So not enough leaven. And um, you done messed up the bread. Too much leaven. And everybody got food poisoning. Bad mixed in with the good. Uh, the fish in the, in the parable that he, that he uh, mentioned where he says that they're going to, they, they, they cast out the drag net. The Greek of the bad, that he calls for the bad fish, 
literally means rotten. It's rotted fish in the Greek. Uh, and he talks about merchants as well, right? Uh, merchants did not have a good reputation back then. It was not considered an honorable profession to be a merchant. Uh, they had the reputation of, of used car dealers that would try to sell you a lemon. And, and uh, bad mixed in with good. He talks about the, the, the person that uh, found a uh, 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 treasure hidden in a field. And then he gave up all that he had and then went and bought that field. So it wasn't his to begin with in the first place. It's some bad mixed in with some good. The kingdom of heaven is not going to look like we think. It's not going to have all the same people that we think should be in there. It's some bad mixed in with some good. Uh, and you can say that about many things. This world is some bad mixed in with some good. And sometimes it seems like the bad outweighs the good. And that the good is so tiny that it can't make a difference. But that doesn't mean we don't keep pushing forward. We have to do the work. We have to go out and find the fish and let God do the separating. He said in the, in, in the example, right, that, that the people that went and got the fish, we're, we're not the ones that separated. Our, our job is to get the fish in the boat. Whether they don't come from the neighborhoods we think they should come from or have the upbringing that we think they should have or have the zip code or the same education level or the same amount of money, that ain't our job. That ain't our job. Our job is to bring them in and let God work the rest out. We do not have a heaven or a hell to put anybody in. We do not have a heaven or a hell to put anybody else in. So we should stop trying to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, the Bible says we work out our own salvation, not somebody else's. <laughs> There's an adage that says there will be two surprises when you get to heaven. They say that the first surprise is going to be you being surprised at everybody else who's there. And the second surprise is going to be everybody else surprised that you were there. It's going to be some things mixed in that we may not think are desirable. They may not dress the way we want them to dress, may not look the way we want them to look, may not smell the way we would want them to smell. But the good news is that even though there will be some bad mixed in with some good, even though there will be some small things that we want to become big, the good news is, is that God can take what little you have, and do more with it than you ever imagined. God will be able to take what little you have and make it work exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever ask or imagine. That's why a small amount of leaven in the text made three measures worth of bread. Three measures in the Bible is like 10 gallons worth. So that little bit of leaven will be able to feed 100 to 150 people. And, and then although small and sometimes forgotten, that little mustard seed can grow to be 10 to 15 feet tall. The things that we think are small the things that the rest of the world may see as worthless have value to you and God. And, and that is all that matters. Uh, the, the, the men in the text went fishing and pulled out a great haul 
So if God gave you the vision, go forth with that vision. Even if the world around you seems against you. If you know God and you know your stuff, it'll be all right. I've seen God take a little and make a whole lot to the point that people say, how did that happen? How did that person get that job? How did that person get that house? How did that person get healed from that sickness? How did that person maintain and restore that relationship if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? We just got to do a little bit, a little bit at a time, and keep doing that little bit over and over again. Uh, so what's the kingdom of heaven like? It, it's like a mustard seed. It's like leaven in a batch of dough. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. It's like a pearl of great price. It's like bulging, a net bulging with fish. It's not a street map. It's, it's not an artistic painting. Jesus gave us hints, suggestions, and intimations, and these hints are the best that we can offer, that anybody can offer. And the fault lies not in the explanation sometimes, but in our understanding. The mustard seed and the yeast are small, but they produce something big. Uh, the merchants and the scribes. There's something bad, but they're mixed in with something good. God provides the increase, and God does the sorting and the dividing and the separating. We can plant, someone else can water, and God provides the increase. I said earlier, you can have heaven here on earth. And I don't say that to discount what happens when you die. But as for believers, we can do more while we live. Uh, the kingdom of God is at hand within arm's reach. When Jesus said that I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, it literally translates into life overflowing out of heaven here on earth. so that we can have abundant life right now. The text says later on, what you bind on earth, you bind in heaven, and what you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. There are little things we can do to bring heaven on earth right now. Doesn't even cost anything. You don't know whose day you could have made just by smiling at them. Just by saying good morning. Just by treating them right. Just by treating them like a proper Christian should. There are little things we can do to make our lives better. You don't have to hit 100% right now. But you can take a step. You don't have to put thousands of dollars in your bank account for emergencies right now. But you can put a dollar. My grandfather, God rest his soul, said all the time, a penny in a pile makes a dollar after a while. We can take small steps. You may not be able to tithe right now but you can put a little on it. You may not get to your ideal rate right now, right? But you can take a walk. You can get water instead of soda. You may not be able to repair that relationship that's broken right now, but you can pick up the phone. And even if they don't pick up, 
That's on them, not you. You can hold, not hold on to the bitterness. They say that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. There are small steps we can take in every facet of our lives, our professional lives, our relationships, uh, the business. There are small little steps we can take. One foot in front of the other. And then when you get down the road, you will be able to see and appreciate how far you've come. Start small. But start now. And only have one goal in mind. To be better today than you were yesterday. Even if you take one step further, you've still taken that step. And if you take one step further each day, it'll be that much better when you get down the line. And so what is heaven like? I don't know. But I know that I can have heaven on earth if I try to take one step further each day. If I try to be better each day than I was yesterday. Even moving as small as a mustard seed, even as small as a little bit of leaven, if I just take one step further, do one thing better, do one thing more, I can see heaven here on earth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come. Pray with me, please. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that went forth, for those who heard it, and for those who may hear it later that if they don't know Christ Jesus in the pardoning of their sins, they will take an opportunity to get to know him and ask, what must I do to become saved? Let your word go forth and be a seed that is planted in good soil and produces a great harvest, 30, 60, 100 fold. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We say that the doors of the church are open, but the fact of the matter is that they've been open for over 2,000 years. Jesus came and gave himself willingly for us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So we say that the doors of the church are open at this time for those who don't know Christ Jesus and the pardon of their sins. This is an opportunity to get to know him. But the doors of the church are also open if you already know Christ in the pardon of your sins and are looking for a new church home. I might be able to recommend one for you on Scott Street. I might just. It is the longest lasting, most important decision you will ever make. Won't you come? There is nothing better than knowing Jesus. I always say it is the longest lasting, most important decision you ever make. Kings and kingdoms will soon fade away. But there is something about the name Jesus. It's ours to offer, yours to accept or reject. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Don't forget to connect with me on social media, Pastor Johnny Simpson Jr. on Facebook, at Pastor J. Simp Jr. on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks again for watching, and God bless.